Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah. Oh, the afternoon, yes, we are. Good afternoon. How are you guys doing, all right? You've had a good week, right? Yeah. All right, we're not done, we're not done. This is one of my favorite things to do, is to talk to these great artists. Some of them you guys know, some of them you, you know the name, and you might not have a face to go with the name, or you not, might not know the music. And this is one of the guys who, if we played you all his music, you'd realize you know all his music. You know what I mean? So it's really exciting to have him here. Um, I'm going to bring him on, and then we'll get talking. Give it up, y'all, for Dave Bruchin. How you doing? You okay? <laughs> no, I'm great. <laughs> I asked Dave, I said, Dave, where do you live? He said, right now I live here. <laughs> so I'm excited to do this. Um, I think uh, everybody who, who saw the concerts knows that I started with Dave very early. And um, so having the chance to speak with you, Dave, is cool because we never really talked about how you got started. You know what I mean? As far back as I go is when you were working with Andy Williams. Is that correct? Did you work with Andy Williams? Uh, I did indeed. Uh, were, were you the music director? Or were you? I started out as a piano player and became the music director. Yeah. Um, so, any musical experiences before that? Like, what was your first? Well, how did you end up on the piano? Let's start from the very beginning because I really want to know. Oh, I don't know. Like every every kid that grows up in a house with a piano in it, and parents that uh, well, both of my parents were musicians. My father was an amazing violinist. But the idea was you took piano lessons when I during the time I was coming up. When you got old enough to to reach the keys, you could, you uh, you messed around with the piano, and then you took piano lessons. I took him from uh, uh, Mrs. Stevenson in Littleton, Colorado. She was the only game in town. <laughs> and it was uh, 25 cents a, a pop for the lesson. <laughs> uh, and I started, I guess when I started, when I was six, I guess, actually trying to learn the piano. It's your, was your father uh, a classical violinist? He was. He was. Uh, he was, my father was from Riga, Latvia, yeah. and he was trained as a, uh, oh, a lot of Latvians here. I've been there, done that. Go Baltics. Okay. <laughs> Go Baltics. No, but he, he learned as a kid violin, and he studied uh, a lot through his life, and he also studied watchmaking. And he was a watchmaker when I came along, and uh, but he never stopped playing the fiddle and particularly uh, walking around the house playing. That's my memory of him, it, it just playing uh, for Chrysler and all these incredible violin things uh, just in the living room. And so my brother and I grew up with music being kind of part of life, you know, nothing special, just something part of everyday life. So that's. That's my beginnings. And when did music become more than just everyday life? When did you say, hey, this is something I'd like to dedicate myself to? Well, <laughs> I, uh, I grew up in Littleton, Colorado, which was kind of a ranch community. And uh, we all, every kid that I know did the same thing. We all thought we were going to be rodeo cowboys <laughs> when we grew up. And uh, we all started to explore that one, one way or another. <laughs> I worked on a ranch for uh, three years during, uh, during my high school years, my s summertime, and I worked for a vet, a veterinarian, and I thought I was going to be uh, a veterinarian, and I had planned to go to vet school <laughs> from the time I could remember until it was time to go to college, and then I got the guilt one day and I thought about all the, all the exposure and the time and uh, uh, just, just being exposed to music that my dad did for us without any expectations. And I thought, oh, I better try 
music school for men. <laughs> Where did you go to? Where, which music school? University of Colorado. So you majored in music. Uh, in, in which town? In Boulder? Boulder. In Boulder. Go Buffs. <laughs> Buffs. <laughs> go Glenn Miller also, right? Uh, yeah. Glenn Miller, he's from... Um, yeah, absolutely right. right. Yep. Yeah. That's my uncle, you know that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you, so you majored in music? I did. At, um, at the University of Colorado? Yeah. And uh, what was your first professional your first first professional gig. Oh, I don't. We we played gigs every weekend, you know, uh, in clubs in Denver and Boulder and around. Uh, I yeah, I guess the first serious uh, the first serious gig I had after I graduated from college, I played piano in the pit orchestra at the at the Central City Opera one summer, <laughs> and I learned all of this. Uh, <laughs> All of this literature I would never have seen before if, I, if it hadn't been for that. But anyway, that was that was just a, a blip in the landscape. It's so funny because you 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 talk about wanting to be a rodeo cowboy, and you know he's got these songs like Mountain Dance, and you got a song called I Wish I Were a Cowboy, right? And I, I just thought I just thought that was your stick, you know what I mean? I just thought you know he's got this cowboy thing, you know what I mean? I didn't realize that you come through it honestly. So, um, so, so when did the Andy Williams gig happen? Uh, the Andy Williams gig. I, after I graduated from college, I spent a year um, in Aspen, Colorado, playing gigs in uh, clubs up there, and and I got my draft notice. Um, and I ran down to Denver to go show up and do what I was supposed to do. And I got so appalled by the inefficiency of that procedure. When they gave us a lunch break, I ran down to the Navy and I joined the Navy. And while I was there, uh, these guys were great. You know, they said, well, uh, do you have a college degree? I said, yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, they're really going to want a music major. <laughs> I said, well, you can be an, be, be an officer because you have already have a degree. So you need to go to uh, Pensacola and go to the officer training school. Did you ever think about flying? I said, uh, yes, I did. <laughs> I said, well, what do you do in this afternoon? I said, I got to go back and finish the uh, <laughs> finish the army physical. No, no, forget that. So, <laughs> so they took me out to uh, Lowry uh, Air Base and uh, put me in an airplane, took me for a ride, and I thought, okay, this is cool. So I signed up for officer's training school and flight training all in the same day. And I thought it was going to turn out to be a totally different day. But anyway, that's, that, that happened for two years. I was. I was on one tour of duty in, uh, in the Navy, and then when I got back, I, uh, I didn't have any serious plan. I thought I wanted to go to graduate school, um, and I, in the process of trying to, trying to get all the credentials together, I, I went back to Aspen and played some war gigs in the clubs up there, and then I went to New York to go to school, to go to graduate school, and a friend of mine was singing in a group called the Ray Charles Singers. <laughs> it was uh, the background singers for a lot of television shows in those days. And he, t he called me and he said, you know, Andy's looking for a piano player. Um, he, I said, well, Andy has a piano player. He's got Hank Jones. I, I'm watching that television show. Hank Jones was, was in that orchestra. He said, but Hank ain't gonna leave and go out on the road with Andy. So I went and met Andy, did a little audition, and uh, then I spent the next four years or so working for him and, um, and, and bailed out of graduate school at that time. I had to leave all of that. Okay, I couldn't stay in town. So that's, that's how- uh, That's how you got Andy. That's how I got that gift, yeah. Hank Jones, yeah. great piano player. Was he the one who played for Marilyn Monroe? 
You know the, the famous happy birthday, Mr. President? Oh, probably. That's right. You yeah. guys remember when Marilyn yeah. sang yeah. Yeah. Yes. happy birthday, Mr. President? I think Hank Jones was piano. That's oh, the trivia. Right. Yeah. Drop that on your friends when you're back on the <laughs> Okay, so, all right, so you're in Andy Williams' band. You started off as a piano player, and Andy realizes that you're the most together guy in the band, so you become the music, the music director, right? Well, I, I had thought, this is, this is going back into college, I thought I was going to try to be, make a living writing music one way or another, and arranging for sure, maybe composing. And uh, so I had spent a lot of time trying to learn how to arrange, and I started, I started writing Andy's book for, for those charts. And so oh, so, so you began to, uh, was this Andy's first tour? Is that what this was? No, 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 he had been out. Um, it's, this, this is a whole other panel we could do on Andy Williams because <laughs> he's from a, another family quartet of brothers that had a whole career as kids, you know, singing with Kate Thompson and doing all these films and so forth. But uh, uh, no, he, he was doing tours and uh, after a year and a half or so doing that, he got a show on NBC television in Los Angeles, which meant a move for me, and, and uh, I just moved there to work on the show. And then, uh, and kept writing, and the conductor of that show was named Colin, Colin Rumhoff was his name, and he left after a year, and uh, then it was my gig. So, that's now, how that happens. I just want to make sure you all know, when he says arranging, <laughs> like for singers like Andy Williams, singers like Frank Sinatra, Nat King Cole, anyone who sings with a big, with a big band or a big orchestra, the arranger is arguably the most important person because what do the violins play? What do the horns play? What do the, the, the French horns play? What, do, what does everybody play? And how do you create all that beautiful background for singers like this? And you are one of the best. So it sounds like um, that was your workshop. Uh, Definitely, absolutely. So did you try stuff you weren't sure was going to work? Every time. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, nowadays we have computers and we can simulate That's right. our, arrange our arrangement. So we know pretty much when you get in front of the orchestra what it's going to sound like. Right. But back then, the only way to do it was to do it and go, ooh. That didn't work in. The beautiful thing about that show for me, uh, I think I did the show for four years, four seasons. And uh, let's see, we taped the show every Friday. And it was still taped television. And we started the next show every Monday. So we had Saturday and Sunday to kind of get your breath a little bit. And then starting Monday, there were a whole new list of uh, songs that we needed to get up and running by the end of the week. And that meant arranging every week whatever the new material was in about three days, because they needed a day for the copyists to, uh, to copy the scores. And then the band came in to rehearse on Thursday night and, and then take the show on Friday. So it was. It was a machine, you know, in a sense, but it was an incredible workshop for me. I mean, incredible way to learn because if if you didn't do it, if you blew it, you knew Im immediately. As soon as the band played it, you knew it was wrong, <laughs> and it, and you could fix it on the spot to a certain extent. And the 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 idea that uh, that was that's what life was for several years, you know, Monday Monday through Friday. So you get you get a, a list of the artists on the on the upcoming right. Andy Williams show That's on Monday. Right. Yep. And you, because once the arranger writes all the music out, you know, Dave's handwriting might be like a doctor's handwriting. You know, where only Dave can understand. It. So you hand it to the copyists, and these professional like calligraphers, right? Right. And they write it out for each instrument. Sometimes you'll have 20, 30 musicians. So you have to get it a couple of days in advance so they can do that. So you only had. You got the list on Monday, a couple, couple of nights, and it's a lot of work, isn't it? A lot of work. What's the worst 
thing that happened in terms of you thinking, oh, this is going to be great, and then when you went like this, you said, oh, no, that's horrible. <laughs> Do you have any memories of stuff that didn't, didn't quite work out? Only because I don't have memories of anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but I'll tell you, it, it was it was such an incredible thing. If you can imagine, uh, and I try to relate it to computer entering stuff on the computer these days. If you'll know if it's not right, and you can you can go back and change it, right? You can. On the computer, yeah. Delete something and, and uh, replace it. In a sense, that w that's what we did on the spot at the rehearsal. So, so if something was wrong, we could usually fix it. Uh, and it all happened so quickly. Uh, I think the band was only in for about uh, three hours on, on the dress rehearsal. I'm sorry, on the uh, on the run through on the music rehearsal, and then the next day. We had a dress rehearsal in the afternoon before the show. It was another chance to fix something. So, so uh, it was all, all clean up. You know that that's my my sense of it. The beautiful one of the beautiful things was I didn't do all of the charts. Um, we had Marty Page, incredible arranger, very well known. Yes. Yeah, he he uh, usually did one. Johnny Mandel, unbelievable, another charts. incredible. Yes, and Billy May. I mean, it was the three great names. Oh yeah. yeah, and they all, they could all do it while they were doing other stuff, you know, they <laughs> one hand tied behind their back. But uh, it, it, it was such a learning experience for me to get exposed, not only to, uh, to the process I just described, but to hear those guys and how, how they uh, approached the same thing and how they solved the same problems, and it was, Every every week was like a, a big premiere event, you know, for me. Did you, did you have any opportunities to speak with with those two? Oh, all the time. Wow, yeah, that must have been incredible. Oh my yeah. lord! Yeah, because now you've got years and years of all these incredible arrangements. We can talk about the movie scores in a minute, but just arrangements—the stuff you did for Diane Shore. Those are. Have you guys ever heard of the stuff that they has done with Diane Shore? Of course you have, right? And these arrangements are just so beautiful. And what I want to know is, does it get? Is it at the point now where you can do it with your hand behind your back? <laughs> no, never got to that point. I'll tell you, it's every time is a learning experience, and it never stops. That one, that's one factor that's always there, and there are no formulas that you can fall into that solve all those problems. So, in a sense, it's like. Starting from scratch one more time, you know. Um, I I like to think. Uh, well, I don't do it anymore. I mean, I don't do that kind of that kind of accelerated work situation anymore. But I got to the point where I could do it fast, which, which was almost almost. Uh, they say it doesn't matter how fast you are, how good is it, but. If sometimes you're in a situation where you don't have that op, that luxury to, to make that de determination. So all you do is make sure it's done, and then by a certain time, in order to in order to not miss the deadline. I got used to the deadline uh, factor in in all of my work now, to where uh, I can't sit around and take my time, even if I have time. I have to, wow. I have to scramble to get it done as fast as I can. Wow. So you. People don't really realize with, with movie scores as well. Yeah. Dead, working with a deadline, you know, because all these kids who come out of these music schools, they go, man, I can't wait to arrange, and I can't wait to um, to to write music, mm -hmm. and they don't really realize in the real music world there's always a deadline, right? It's the same with basketball players who I can't wait to get to the pros, and they get around that 60th game of the season, and their knees are hurting, and their big toe is hurting, you know. <laughs> And they didn't know nothing about playing basketball with a big toe that hurts. You know what I mean? But, right? You know, just the physical aspect, like the, the pressure, because you know, there's always a lot of money on the line, you know, and they always wait to the last minute to hand Dave Goosen uh, a requirement, an assignment. And then it's a lot of pressure. How, how do you handle it? How, how did you handle the pressure? Stay up all night. <laughs> Not all night, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, you just get, uh, and you can't, you can't get 
angry about it. I mean, or upset about it. That's part of it's part of how you. Uh, in fact, you're grateful to have the time to be able to do it. <laughs> and uh, if it means you, you miss a little sleep, that's that's the way that goes. Yeah. Um. I remember a, a, an assistant engineer, and it was about four o'clock a.m. And he goes, guys, I'm really tired. <laughs> like, dude, dude, that sentence doesn't exist in this business. You know what I mean? He was like, when are we going home? We're we'll going home when we get done. <laughs> okay, so what was your first movie job? How, everyone wants to know, all the young composers want to know, how do I get in the movie game? And uh, of course, everyone who does movies has a different story. But what was your story? How did you get into it? Uh, this, is, this is the story of my life. Everything, I've, everything new thing I've done, I kind of just fell into based on what I just came from. So, um, I think the first film I did was something called Divorce American Style. Um, and the, how did I get, oh, the, the uh, executive producers of that film were Norman Lear and Bud York, and, who had been the executive producers of the Andy Williams show for several years. So I got to meet these guys, and, uh, and then that, that started off that way, and then uh, uh, I just, when you say everybody does it a different way, that's absolutely right. I always felt like I went from this thing to that thing to that thing like, like you know those uh, steel balls in a pinball machine? That's, that's what I felt like, bouncing <laughs> off that thing and into the next thing, and almost without any choice on my part. You know, it's just, that's just how everything happened. Did you have, um, did you, so did you have conversations with Norman Lear? You guys know that Norman Lear, he created All in the Family, he created, he essentially created the sitcom, yeah. American sitcom, sitcom. So what were your conversations with him like? Norman is, was and is. The Jeffersons, by the way, is, if you not leave that out. <laughs> and uh, he was, from the, from the time I met him, was this unassuming guy. You did have no idea. If you didn't know what he did, you, you couldn't guess what this guy did for a living. But he had such a good overview of uh, what entertainment was and what people would probably like. And he's still, you know, Norman is still on the board of Concord Records. Right yes, now. yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he, he was so versatile and had so many things going for him. And such a sweet guy. He's also. Um, he also had an amazing charity that he supported, you know, People for the American Way, it's called. Uh, it's an amazing, progressive kind of democracy, big D um, a charity that uh, I was always, always so proud of him for jumping on that. Man, this is answering a question for me because you all might not know this. Norman Lear TV theme. Which yes. one did you write? Well, no, I gotta say, which black one did you write? Come <laughs> 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 on, Dave, tell me. Are you talking about Maud? Nope, she's not black. <laughs> <laughs> Now, here's, here's a memory thing for you. Which, which one did Donnie Hathaway sing? He sang Maud. Okay. Yeah. Donnie Hathaway, did you all know that? Donnie Hathaway sang Maud. Did you write, okay, did you write Good Times? Good Times. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, let's get this right, because every black person in America knows every word to Good Times. Okay, I, I know you write the lyrics, but you yeah. wrote the music. Yeah. And how does a mountain cowboy <laughs> end up writing the theme song for Good Times with JJ? Yeah. <laughs> that was that was after I had met you and worked with you. <laughs> hey, hey, can I, can I jump? I'm gonna jump into the you know, a, a few years later, and then we'll go back to where we are, David. But 
this guy is incredibly versatile because I think he was telling you guys a story. Um, Dave and his partner Larry Rosen, they had an incredible record label called GRP, right? And one of the early artists that they signed was my homeboy, Tom Brown, from Jamaica Queens, Tom plays the trumpet. And I don't know which one of you guys came up to the Breezin Lounge in Harlem to hear Tom and he said, this guy's fantastic, you guys signed him. And Tom said, I'd like to use my band, right, for the recording session. And Tom walks in with like nine guys, I think the oldest guy was 18, <laughs> you know, these brothers from, from Jamaica, Queens, and Dave was like, I'm gonna like, I wonder what Dave Bruce, because I had heard him, what do you think about all these young brothers coming in here? We cut Jamaica Funk, right? You remember oh, Jamaica yeah. Funk? Yeah. Jamaica yeah. Funk. Yeah. You know who's playing piano on that? <laughs> the Cowboys. <laughs> Cowboys playing piano on Jamaica Funk. So, good time and Jamaica Funk, okay? Colorado, that don't even sound right. <laughs> but this is just a testament, Dave, to your musicianship, your musicality, your ears. He said, okay, this, this song needs something. He just came in after we had been rehearsing. He came in and sat down at the piano. And I'm not talking about like playing the quiet piano, you know, like we're just, you know, not gonna get in anybody's way. No, he took over the track, you know? <laughs> so next time you hear Jamaica Funk, listen to the acoustic piano and think about dude with a cowboy hat. <laughs> All right, so that's a diversion. But I just wanted to make sure that that wasn't a rumor. <laughs> and then when you said no Lear, then it didn't make sense. You know? I got to tell you now, with Ma, when we did the demo for Ma, trying to figure out who could sing it, because we knew we we knew we wanted Donny Hathaway to do do the track, but how do we get a demo to him? So. Made a couple of calls, and uh, Marilyn and Alan Bergman were, were the writers, lyricists on this thing. And we talked about it. I said, "Well, let's call, let's call him and see if he'll do it." Quincy Jones. He sang the demo that we oh. sent to Donnie Hathaway. And probably why Donnie agreed to do it. How did he sound? Did he sound okay? He sounded fine. He could have used it. He sounded well above average as a lot of people So, okay, so um, that's the TV thing, right? And then the, the, the movie thing got started when? Well, that... Uh, Another pinball bounce. <laughs> 1966 was the, was the first one. And, uh, and I got kind of busy in the 60s, late 60s and 70s. And uh, finally, it just, uh, when, I, when I describe it as the pinball machine, it's like, can you, you get a call, can you do this film? Well, let me see. Yeah, I can do it, because I'll be done with this one by that time. So it, it rolled along like that for quite a while. I had, a, I had an agent who uh, uh, understood, <laughs> understood me well enough to know that I wasn't going to double up, but if I were, but it, it just became a lifestyle, you know, to have a gig like that, to have the next uh, the next production sitting there waiting. So you, you made sure your agent knew that you were not going to be in that situation where you have two films going on. Yeah, yeah, if I could possibly avoid it. I mean, it happened once in a while, something goes, something ran over late, you know, and, and uh, crosses over in the same time frame. But, uh, but you don't set out and set it up that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And... Are there any films in the early, in the, in the late 60s when you began to do this that stick out even though I know it's probably a haze of work from one, <laughs> from one project to the other? Are any of them sticking out for you? Yeah, I think um, the one that, I can't remember which one this was, because um, I think it's something like 130, you know, if I count them all. <laughs> but, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There was a picture called The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. Yes, yes. And I don't think it was in the 60s, I think it was a little later than that, but thematically, that was sort of the first time they gave me kind of the size orchestra that I really wanted, uh, as opposed to trying to economize and everything. And I had the experience of working with this 
incredible bunch of musicians and freelance musicians in Hollywood uh, who are among, you know, among the best in the world and not only good individual musicians, but they know how every time they see each other every day, they got to be an ensemble, you know, for that project. And it's a new one every day. So the, just the experience of going through that was, uh, when I think back about that. That must have been an incredible experience. Like, and do you think writing music is like you know, a muscle? In other words, the more you write, the better you get at it. Yeah, and you don't want to stop because you know what happens when you stop exercising. It's the same thing, isn't it? Absolutely. So what about finding, uh, do you tell us the process? You sit down with the director. Usually when you did a film, was the film already finished? Not finished, but uh, you could see what it was. You can see what it looked like. And you knew they were going to make a lot of edits and changes. Uh, but. But if you were lucky enough to get it early, you got to jump on it. And you, at least you have some kind of direction to start thinking about. Okay, so what's your process? Were you looking at different characters and writing different themes for different characters? Or were you looking at different relationships in the film and trying to write a theme for that? What was the process? All of the above. You know, and they were, it was all kind of different. Sometimes, sometimes you, you sit there trying to, you know, here, here's the process of composition. You start with a note, right? <laughs> the most important note in the whole place is going to be the next one. <laughs> because that means you went from here to there, and that's called an interval. And that's already got a personality to it. And you add the third one, forget about it. You know, you're, you're stuck. <laughs> So, I'm, I'm talking about melodic writing. Um, you, hear, you, you can go back and listen to songs that you love and you can, you can see what I'm talking about. Um, and if you're starting from scratch, then you've got to get that, you got to get that second interval so you're happy with it. That second note is the one. That That's determines the line, doesn't it? Yeah, it starts, that starts the line. And then the next one, you're really committed. You know, the third one. <laughs> Um, but normally what, what inspires me, I guess, is, would be the word, rather than the story or even the, even the scene, you, you know you're going to have to do these various scenes that require different kinds of music, but to have thematic material that, that you think is going to work for the film, what, what inspires me is what it looks like. And I'm talking about the cinematography and the lighting and the, the uh, speed of the cuts between scenes. And it really, it really throws me into an area musically where at least it's a starting place for me. I, I don't mean it, I've solved it at all, but it's some place I can start when you're sitting there thinking, what the hell am I going to do with this picture? It's a, it's a way to start. And you may, you may be wrong, but it doesn't matter. You got to do something. You got to you got to make the move, even to prove you're wrong. You have to make the move. Right. So you look at the cinematography. You look yeah. at the movement of the of the actors. Yeah. Because there's rhythm in all of those things. There's pace. And and more than that, the uh, the rhythm of how they edited the film. The cuts. The cuts. From picture to picture. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, First film I did, I wrote a great piece of music then. And the director came and said, that is a great piece of music, but I can't hear any words that my actors are saying. Right? So I overwrote, you know what I mean? I, I said, oh yeah, I guess that would be important, wouldn't it? <laughs> so leave some room for the dialogue. So you have to write some specific melodies yeah. that can fit in yeah. between what the actors are saying. Right? Absolutely. And if it's, if it's a real talky, singing a lot of conversation, it doesn't mean that there isn't music that'll work there, but you can't be, you can't be getting off on your, uh, you know, your melodic uh, right. desires that everything you, everything you ever wanted to write, that's not the place to do it. But <laughs> you, just, you just set a mood, or at least that's my thing. Everybody does it in a different way. 
to set a mood for, uh, for I mean, I can break it down to real basic things like you, you all know what a major chord is and a minor chord and the difference. And traditionally, we're trained, we're kind of brought up to think that, oh, minor is sad and major is happy. You know? <laughs> There you go. That's, that's, the most, you, yeah. that's the most basic thing. So I don't mean it's that simple, but it's as a place to start. It's um, it, it can help you can help guide you into a place that you uh, that you want to be uh, melodically. And the other thing that that makes it work for me always made it work for me. And and if I didn't find it, it didn't work at all. I have to like what I'm doing. I have to like what it sounds like. Because if I don't, nothing's going to work later on in the film. Mm -hmm. And you want to, I, I always wanted to extract uh, elements from, let's say, a main theme, whether it was a main title or not, but the theme of the film. I wanted to extract elements of that to actually score different scenes within the film. So you'd have a, you'd have a main theme yeah. that for you, is the movie theme right and then you modify or extract things from that main theme right for different other scenes in the movie exactly, exactly. so if you don't come up with that main theme something you like you're going to be miserable the whole yeah. time yeah okay so would you say that as a, a film composer the music is your vision or would you say that the music is the director's vision and you're just supporting that which way or is it a, some combination of both uh hopefully it's a combination of both but I don't think I'm going to get his uh, sanction unless I like it. Right. So you start with something like you like first. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's the biggest difference? Because you began to make your own records, Dave yeah. Brewson, uh, uh, after your movie career. Not even, but it started after your movie career was already gone. Yeah. What was the biggest difference uh, making records for yourself, Dave Brewson? Didn't have to worry about your director. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's that's. No, that's true. Come on, you know that's true. <laughs> Think about it. What, what? How musical were the directors that you used? In other words, were they able to communicate if they didn't like something? Were they able to tell you what they didn't like about it? Or was that up to you? They're right. all over the place, and I'm telling you, um, I worked I worked with a director named Sidney Pollack for maybe 14 films I did with him. And he's, Sidney's not a musician, but he's, he loves music so much. This is how much he, he loves music. He, if he likes it too much, he worries that it's not working for the scene. He just likes how it sounds. <laughs> so he overthinks it. Yeah. And we've had to, I've had to back off on several instances because of that. Mm. I mean, he's just, uh, when I say he loves music, he, he loves to listen to music. He doesn't play anything, but, but if you're playing for him, he's in heaven. Um, and if it's, uh, if he's too happy, I, I, did a, I did a picture for him called Three Days of the Condor. And uh, uh, they took it to a preview. You know, where they, they show before they release the film. Sometimes they take a, a version out to see how it re, how people react before they actually finish dubbing the film. And he called. He called me. I couldn't go to that one. He called me and he said, "Well, we we did the preview. We did went to Santa Barbara and did the preview." I said, "How'd it go?" He said, "He said I'm not sure. Tell me if I should be worried about this." I said, "What is that?" He said, "Well, during the main title." Uh, everybody was tapping their feet. <laughs> I said, well, that, that's a good thing. That, he said, that would be a good thing. <laughs> he right. said, but, but then, or how are they going to get back in the story? I said, well, I, that's, I don't know that. But, but I know this thing works with the, with the titles. I know this theme works with the titles. And, uh, and maybe it's a good thing that they're not ready for all the disaster that's going to come up. <laughs> well, so it sounds like you was worried that if the music is too good, it's going to take the attention away from the most important thing, which is the story. You think that's what it was? Not necessarily exactly that way, but 
but uh, <laughs> going to mislead people into th thinking, oh, this is, this is a film that's oh, going to... This, this film has yeah. some darkness. I know, yeah, I yeah. know the music because you released yeah. the, the score as an album. Right. So I know right. the album, but I, I never saw the movie. Okay, so uh, can we talk about Larry Rosen? Okay. Oh, if we have to. <laughs> <laughs> Larry Rosen, it was GRP, so it was Bruce and Rosen Productions, and they were a team, they were a fantastic team. As a matter of fact, I was telling somebody here how well you two work together. It seems like uh, the things that you were focused on and the things that Larry was focused on really complemented each other, and you guys really, uh, really changed the music business with your label. I'll talk about how later, but how did you, how did you end up meeting Larry? Larry was uh, quite a few years younger than I am. Um, I heard about him. Somebody called me and said, "You got to hear this band. It's a bunch of kids, mostly from the city, and they're in a big band called the Newport Youth Band." <clears throat> and it was a, it was uh, uh, a bunch of kids that this, uh, who's who's the guy that put it together? Marshall, not Marshall Royal. I can't think of his name. But anyway, there was, there was a guy in New York, a jazz guy that got all these kids from all high schools all over the city and put this jazz band together, and they played every year at the Newport Jazz Festival. And, of course, as, as time went on, these kids would graduate, and there'd be people replacing them and so forth. But Larry was the drummer. Uh, at, at this particular time, somebody, somebody told me I ought to hear the band, so I listened to the band. And then, yeah, I, was, I was still working with Andy Williams in those days, touring a little bit. And I had talked him into taking a drummer on the road instead of just a piano player using pickup bands. <laughs> and I said, if we had a drummer that knew the book, it'd be so much easier with these rehearsals, you know, the, for the rest of the band. Mm -hmm. So I asked, uh, I asked Larry, I called Larry and asked him if he'd be interested. And of course, <coughs> he's a bebop drummer. You know, why does he want to go out and play drums with the Andy Williams show? You know? But he did. He wanted the gig, and uh, that's how we first met and started actually playing together. And the first, the first real jazz album I did uh, was, was a bebop album, and uh, with Thad Jones and uh, Frank Foster and uh, Milt Hinton, and Larry Rosen was the drummer. So you had Larry in there with the real cast, yeah. yeah. And, and how did he do? He did great. He's just always, that was his medium, you know, mm -hmm. the big band thing was his medium. Mm -hmm. so. And so you guys uh, became good friends, I'm sure. Oh yeah. yeah. And then when did you guys decide, hey, you know what, we need to put together a record label? Yeah. He had, Larry, uh, in addition to, <laughs> to the Andy Williams gig, which was not full time by any means, he was doing a lot of gigs and with, uh, on Saturday nights, you know, bar mitzvahs and weddings and so forth, in, uh, locally in uh, New York and northern New Jersey and so forth. He called me one day and he said, you know, there's a guy playing, playing bass in this little band and he's a great singer and we ought to record him. I said, really? Okay. His name was John Lucien. Oh, wow. And John lived right up the right up the road here not too far you know he, right. he's from from uh st croix i think was his home anyway he was living in new york and uh, doing these gigs and and writing music incredible songs so we did a we just self-financed a little album when we did with john we started playing put the tracks down in larry's basement in new jersey he had, a, he had a keyboard of some kind. We started that way, and then uh, uh, we came out to Los Angeles to uh, actually sweeten the record with uh, with some uh, strings and so forth. And that's how we started. It was just just a, a whim that this guy sings so good we got to record him, or he needs to be recorded, whether it's us or whoever. Mm -hmm. And then Larry on his other hat 
which was this unbelievable deal maker. I mean, forget Donald Trump. Larry was in his deals. <laughs> and he, uh, he, he, would, he would do things. Oh, he took this thing, I think, to RCA. He met somebody over there, and RCA said, oh, yeah, we'd like that. Go release it. Uh, and we were the producers. But it, it wasn't our label. We didn't we didn't own anything. We just got the got the gig for got the uh, record deal for John. And then uh, time went on. We uh, we started recording other people. This is before we had the label. Um, I'm thinking of uh, Earl Clue was one of the guitar player. And and he was ridiculous, you know. He was, uh, Incredible player. Can, can, you, can you just tell us about um, how you heard Earl Clue? Yeah. Uh, the club you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Who was the owner of that club? George Benson. No, but who, but who was who was the Jimmy manager? Jimmy Boyd. Jimmy Boyd. Yes, he was a, he managed the club. That's right. Jimmy Boyd told us about Earl because Earl had played a little rhythm guitar for Benson. Yes, I that's think, right. As a that's kid, right. fourteen-year-old kid in Detroit or something. So we heard Earl and we heard demo and so forth, and, and that's how we uh, we got into him. Anyway, after we made the uh, after we made the record, I guess it was an LP in those days. Uh, Larry was on a plane going home to New Jersey from Los Angeles. <coughs> Clive Davis was sitting up in the first class area somewhere, and Larry being Larry, went up there and he said, hey Clive, uh, Larry Rosen, uh, I have an idea, I have a great idea. Uh, you know, I've been working with Dave Grusin and, and Larry, I don't think, I don't think Clive had a clue who any of us were. <laughs> and Larry said, we, I have this idea for a production company involving certain kind of music with, with these young, amazing jazz players. And he intrigued Clive enough that he sat down next to him. And by the time they, by the time they got to New York, Larry had a deal with Clive, <laughs> a production deal, not not a label, but. And uh, so, by production deal, you guys would do the music. Yeah. Would you pay for the music yourself? No. So you would do the music, and then you funnel it through Clive. Was he Arista Records, Arista Records? Arista Records, yeah. So, so uh, you would do the records, yeah. You put it out through through. Clive's that's later. Right. Yes, right. If he liked it. If he liked it. Yeah. But and wait a minute. So <laughs> let's talk about Larry and his personality. Because somebody was just asking me, you know, they say, hey, our son is a guitar player and he's, he's, he's really into his music, but he's not into like the whole meeting people and, 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 and all that stuff. And I said, well, Dave Goosen had a, a partner who that was his thing. You know what yeah. I mean? And it sounds like I, I wasn't lying, right? Larry, Larry Rosen, he was a go getter, wasn't he? Oh, man. And it left you free to do what you do, which is arrange, produce, and yeah. yeah. But he was also, when we were recording with you, Dave, he was also the engineer. Absolutely. Sound engineer. He taught himself to be an engineer <laughs> in, his, in the same house in New Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. Happened to buy a house that somebody had had a four-track recording studio in, <laughs> and he learned how to use it, and uh, never stopped learning. You know, it was just amazing. Earl Clue, uh, first John Lucien. Earl Clue, I remember Angela Bofield. Angela. Oh, yeah. Angie Bofield, you guys remember her? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Dave Valentine. Yes, indeed. Uh, Tom Brown. Yeah. Did you guys, was Phoebe Snow sound with you or was she just a guest on your album? No, I think. I don't, yeah, we, we, we produced her album, but, but it wasn't our album. Right, yeah. Okay. Anybody else that in the early days? Tom I Scott. You about Tom Brown. Who? Tom Scott. Tom Scott. Tom Scott. Did you produce a Tom Scott album? We did a Tom Scott album. We did a uh, Bernard Wright album. <laughs> now that Bernard Wright album and the Donald Blackman album. And Donald Blackman. These are two guys from from my neighborhood, Jamaica Queens. Those records are are classics. I mean, I mean, if you go to the UK and you mention Donald Blackman, he only he only did that one record. That's with right. You guys, but it's. You know, in the UK they call it a rare, you know, the thing is rare, you know, which means right. it's a classic, 
that not everybody knows about, but that Donald Glassman, the yeah. album was incredible. And so GRP, at this point, is really established. Everybody knows that the quality is going to be really consistent, no matter who the artists are. And then you guys took it another level with the CD thing, right? CDs weren't that, um, they were very new, and people weren't sure whether this medium, these CDs, were gonna last. Yeah. And you guys, well, why don't you tell the story? So, so tell us about the CD. Thing. Yeah. Uh, it, when CDs first emerged, of course, they were gonna, they were gonna be amazing because they didn't scratch. Mostly because they did wasn't a needle going around on your thing to scratch it up. You know, it stayed clear forever. <coughs> digital sound. Um, we can have a digital sound discussion at some point. Mm -hmm. It's not all, not all pluses, you know, not all minuses. Anyway, the beginning, it, as a medium for music to go out, to be sold, when it came, when it came time for that to happen, everybody on every label decided, oh boy, we're gonna, we're gonna hit it now. And all the artists on, say, on CBS, on Columbia Records, they all wanted their stuff released on, uh, on CD, of course. And there were a lot of artists. Our label had, I don't know, six artists. And so we were able to, we were able to jump on that medium easier than the big guys because we didn't have that many to worry about. We didn't have that, that, that line up there waiting, waiting for uh, just capacity in the factories to be manufactured. But they, they might not have had that many CD manufacturing. Exactly. Uh, that That's right. Yeah. yeah. And the ones they did have, uh, some of the big labels had their own. We didn't, of course, but we used some great independent, small independent manufacturers in um, Utah, as I remember. <laughs> it's all like, uh, the other thing that came along that kind of came and went that I thought was going uh, was going to happen where it was called uh, digital audio tape DAP, and I thought, oh, this is it. It's going to replace cassettes. It's a great sound, right? And, and little tiny things to carry around. Well, that didn't go. It was big for about five years. That's right. And then yeah. it disappeared. Right? Yeah. But you guys, so you guys, uh, were you putting out? albums at the same time, or did you commit completely 100% to CDs? We put out both for a while, until it looked like uh, the CDs were really the marketplace. We had a, we had a funny, uh, when I think about the business, and Larry, Larry knew this business, he tried to get me involved in the business part of it, and I, I you know, paddled around and and agreed with them most of the time and <laughs> so forth. But I never really got the the whole marketing idea that he had. And that was so specific. We had such a specific kind of music and and a relatively limited number of artists that we were trying to push that he found out how to market this thing on an individual basis that, that a lot of big labels couldn't do. And uh, uh, one of the thing, one of the things he did. This is how creative he was. He was in, he was in an audio file. I, I'm sorry, an audio equipment place one day on 48th Street. I can't remember the name of it. And he played. He, he talked to the owner and he played the CD. And they thought, wow, this is great. And we ended up being kind of the label that provided product. For, for hardware manufacturers to present their, their stereo gear. So and somebody was trying to, to, to get you to buy their high-end audio yeah. file stereo system. Yeah, it was always a GRP record that they played. Yeah, yeah. 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 sonically it was just, it, it got to, I mean, we were so careful with each thing. It yeah. got to be the point where it was, it was a good way to demo your, uh, your gear. I know when I would walk into a record store when they existed at this time, the first thing you'd see is a, a tree of CDs and it would be the GRP tree, right? And you called yourselves a digital master company, right? That's right. Which means that we pay really, really close attention to the quality, everything is 
recording digitally. Now there's an argument about what sounds better digital or the old school, which is analog. But at that point, digital was the future. And, and because these guys were so consistent with the quality of the music, you could just close your eyes and grab three of the CDs <laughs> and you'd know you'd be happy. You know, and this was, yeah. I'm sure this was Larry's, Larry's thinking. You know, yeah, he, was, he was really a genius at that time. Oh, man, big time. How long was the lifetime of GRP? When um, did it end? When did it end? In 1990, or... Uh, Early 90s, right? No, late 90s. Mid 90s. Mid 90s. We, sold, we had been distributed by, by uh, MCA, Universal, and they finally got to a point where they, they said, you guys ought to let us buy the label because, you know, well, it won't change much for you, and we'll have uh, we'll have a you know more fluid way of getting the product out there. So that's what it, that's what happened. We sold the label, sold the publishing company to Paramount Music, um, and I don't, I don't I don't remember anything else. I'm not sure. It was, it was a sense. I bet you remember that check. <laughs> <laughs> The reason I say that is because that was what we all said, man, that's a success story. You know, these guys started off as musicians, right, but they didn't just stay as musicians. They said, you know what, let's get into the business part of it. They recognized if they worked together, they'd have even more of a strong team because of your different talents. And then you guys took it all the way to the end and then sold it. So this was like our, you guys were like our, our North Star. It's like, you know what? Get into the business part of it too, and figure out how to really take advantage of all your opportunities. So we're really proud of you guys. Yeah. And I saw Larry Rosen at, in, a, in a, the fitness center at a hotel, yeah. in like the, the Chateau Marmont or something like that. And I said, how are you doing today? Because the news had just come out the day before. He said, I'm doing great. <laughs> I'm doing great. He's no longer with us. No. God rest his soul, but he was an incredible human being, as are you. And I learned so much from just watching you, you know what I mean? We went to Japan, he brought us, Dave brought us, all the guys I was telling you about, the young cast from Jamaica, he brought us to Japan for the first time in 1979. Wow. And it was called the GRP All-Star. Wow. And uh, right. Dave's special guest was Sadao Watanabe. Right. He right. was a uh, saxophonist, Japanese saxophonist. He was the first saxophonist to go to Berkeley College of Music. Right. Ever. And at that point, Dave, he was a national oh, treasure in Japan, yes. right? So our first tour lasted a month. And because he's a Dow, he's a local hero, he didn't play just the main, you know, the main four cities that we all play in Japan. Right. We went to all everywhere. Sorts. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. And we're talking like Tokyo is Japan, but it's like international Japan. But when you get to a town called like Niigata or something like that, <laughs> where the beds are like really small and the ceilings are low. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, if you had to use the restroom, there were no toilets, it was just a porcelain hole in the restroom. Right. You remember that? So it was an incredible, incredible experience for all of us. You know what I mean? Because yeah. which is like 19 years old, it was incredible. Um, what are you doing now? What's, what's a day boost not to now? Well, I've got a new hobby. Uh, it's called medicine. <laughs> I'm not practicing medicine. I'm just indulging it. Uh, well, I, I'm. <laughs> I'm halfway kidding, but when I look at my calendar. <laughs> That's why I see these appointments lined up. <laughs> my, my. Well, you know, Lee Rittenhouse was telling us that, uh, you know, when you guys are traveling in the airport, you know how you take the escalator up? Oh. The Dave is taking the stairs and passing them. So, uh -huh. so, I'm sorry, we went kind of long because it's so interesting for me, but can we get a couple of questions from the audience before yeah. we end? Okay, I got, do I have one back there? Yes. Um, you said you did 130 movies. How many of them did you actually get to watch? <laughs> <laughs> After you 
watch some of them, did you think, well, I could have did something a little different with that movie? Or, you know, like that? Just in case you guys can't hear him, he said, Dave, you did 130 some odd movies. How many of them did you actually get to watch? And the other question is, if you did watch them, what was your reaction? Did you sometimes go, oh man, I could have done a better job like that, or oh, that was, I wish I could have changed that? I'd say maybe about half of them I felt that way about. And um, I, I, don't mean to, I don't mean to be cavalier about it, it's just that when, you, when you're concentrating on what you're doing and you think you got it, and then you go as far as you can, and you, when you let it go, it's your baby, and you're, you're happy about it, but you're on to the next thing. When you go back and look at it, sometimes years later, you have all kinds of second thoughts about it. Well, you know, um, distance gives you a different perspective, and you don't really have the benefit of distance with those deadlines. Absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, is there a question over here? Yeah, first I want to thank you for serving uh, in the military. <laughs> And the second question I have, and a question I have for you is, at what point do you overcome stage fright as a, as a performer? Um, you all do such a phenomenal job on stage. When does that happen? How does that happen? At what point do you overcome stage fright as a performer? When does that happen? Um, sometimes it feels like it never happens. Uh, on the other hand, when I when I was in college studying piano, I had a, I had a major professor by the name of Storm Bull. <laughs> he, was, he was a Norwegian. He was a great nephew of, of Edward Grieg and a great grandson of Ole Bull, who was a famous uh, violinist in those days. And Storm had a uh, little seminar for his particular students. We we go once a week, and he tell he talk to us not only about music, but about the whole idea of of being piano players and what it meant, and how to approach uh, how to approach an audience, and uh, mostly with, with the, the thing you're talking about, stage fright. Mostly, if you're concentrating on what you're supposed to be doing, I mean, which, which is about the only way it works when you're playing in front of people, then stage fright, you don't have time to really deal with that. And if you are aware of it, it's, it's a problem because that means you're not deep into the music. But, but Storm used to have a, an exercise he would do, and I'll, I'll show you what he did. He would make each of us go over to the side of the stage and come over to the piano and you get there and you bow. And as you're bowing, you're saying, screw you. <laughs> so you just you take the audience out of the equation. <laughs> okay, last question. Yes, sir. Yeah, when you do a soundtrack, uh, with the director and the production company and so forth. Do you own the rights to the music or do they? And he said, what, sorry. second part of the question, one of the soundtracks that I really loved that you did was Clara's Heart. And I don't know that you ever released it, did you? Okay, so the question was when you do a soundtrack for a movie, do you own the rights to that soundtrack or does it belong to the film company? And then the second thing he asked was uh, one of his favorite Dave Bruce film scores was Clara's Heart. Yes. And he wants to know if Dave ever released that as a movie score album. As an album, I, uh, the second part is, I don't know if it was ever released as an we'll album. Find it. The, the answer to the first part is, normally we have no ownership uh, or, or management uh, of music once we, once we give it to the studio. Changes a little bit over the years. It used to be they, they also owned all the publishing, um, all the performance rights, etc. Et it's changed a little bit, and I think there are people now who are uh, heavyweight enough to maybe make deals that they get they'll share in some of that, you know, in, in some ownership and so forth. It's called a work for hire. So if you do, That's right. if you write music for a film, 
they basically own the rights to the film. Right. If you're heavyweight, you can get some of the publishing back, and publishing is some of the money that's made off the, right. off the music. Or if they don't have enough money to pay you what you normally get, you that's might be right. able to make a deal. Exactly. Easy. Let, let me get a little bit of the publishing. Okay, this has been amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.